нас бандера, Україна мати, ми за Україну будем воювати, батько наш бандера, Україна мати, ми за Україну будем воювати. What do you mean war? We are in 2022, in the 21st century. Where does war come in, huh? The city of Oterka, a fortress, it always withstood waves of invaders. And now, Russia has attacked our Oterka. At 4.08 a.m., I was at my workplace. I gave the order to assemble the regiment. At 5 a.m., we were getting ready to meet the enemy. We also knew that the 93rd Mechanized Brigade was coming. And just as the Russian convoy was entering the city, our guys from the 93rd Brigade were coming to the line of defense. The Russian convoy was already on the next street. Two companies took positions on the outskirts of the city, and the third reached the bridge across the Vorsklo River. They sent a car for reconnaissance, and it returned saying a large convoy was coming. When the convoy did come, our commander at first could not believe it could be so large. But then it reached us, and we gave them a fight. A convoy of armored vehicles was battling through us. They fired rocket-propelled grenades, but it's hard enough to destroy a tank with a grenade launcher. They were followed by a mobile command vehicle of the 96th Reconnaissance Brigade. It did not pass. The 94th Operational Support Regiment was stationed in the city. They took up defense inside the city to meet this convoy. Ambushes were launched by soldiers armed with RPGs. They were on the roofs, on the roof of the church, on the roof of the barracks. We were waiting. The commander called. Go look around the town, he said. Can you see them in the town? I drove around the town. I saw a convoy of cars. I was seventh in it. Then I saw a tank. I thought, great, our tanks will defend us. Then I saw them turning to our firing field. And I saw who was sitting on them. Well, definitely not our guys. The enemy was at 9 a.m. The enemy was already in the city. There was no time to waste. We distributed weapons and ammunition. We received weapons, went to the intersection between the park and the military base, and took up defense. Actually, apart from our military unit, 
the National Guard and the partially formed territorial defense units were here when the Russians entered the city. They took the first blow. Had the enemy captured Otirka, they would have turned it into a strong point from which to seal off Kyiv from the direction of Otirka or Kharkiv from the west. And then he reported to me and said, Colonel, these are Russians. What shall we do? I remember the chief of staff and I pressed the push to talk button on the walkie talkie simultaneously and said, Fuck them. Literally. The regiment commander gave the order to prepare for action and to open fire. We had already heard shots. I told the personnel to stay, not to leave their positions. As soon as you give the first order, that's it. Your old life no longer exists. You realize this later. It feels better. It really feels better. I met the former commander of this regiment, and he shouted, Igor, where are you going? I said, to the commander. He ordered me to come, so I was going. He said, come with us. A reconnaissance unit is on the Kyiv highway, moving towards Zinki. Come. We'll intercept them. Come. There's ammo for a grenade launcher. So, we stopped them near the gas station at the town exit. One tank got confused at the intersection and struck a traffic light. Maybe we shot its triplex glass, so it started spinning and hit the traffic light. It didn't know where to go, or maybe it couldn't see. Then there was a convoy of wheeled vehicles, and we smashed them all. And it went no further than the bridge. The last truck was with ammunition. We shot it with a Mucha RPG. One guy jumped out. We shot him, and another fell out of the cockpit. He was already dead. We saw the first Russian servicemen killed in action. You could tell from their luggage that they came to stay. They came to liberate us and to stay. He was so fat that four of us could barely throw him into a pickup. We were told that he had a medal for fighting in Syria. He came here as if he was going to a parade in a brand new uniform with medals. They didn't need them anymore. We hit the tanks and the IFVs. It was a serious convoy. The command post of the 96th Reconnaissance Brigade, the Russian 4th Guard Tank Division, it was supposed to manage the deployment of the other Russian units. It came under fire from our APC. We stopped their Tiger and Typhoon AFVs. Fifteen paratroopers escaped. They took up the fence on the outskirts of town, in the forest. Later we chased them, and after two weeks together with the reconnaissance unit of the 93rd Brigade, we hunted them down and took them captive. Some captive? Others not. But no one got away. 
зуб паек русский. Вот так вот. Вот она, техника стоит. Місто Охтирка під контролем українських збройних сил. В місті Охтирка е, ворожих військових угрупувань немає. Дякую. Е, на нас ворожі військові на нас нападають з боку Росії. Тому Охтирка сьогодні повністю підконтрольна е, військовослужбовцям України. Дякую. Бригаді спокій. This was the first day of the war. We smashed the convoy, we captured their equipment, it got easier. The guys who fired the grenade launcher saw it for the first time that day. They had a short training session and they delivered fire. The 91st is an engineer corps. They are completely, they have another mission. But they beat the shit out of them, you know? We are not a combat force. We are a supporting force. So we had no heavy weapons apart from an, an APC and RPGs. Our task is mining terrain, mining roads, and mining bridges, spanning rivers, getting weapons, equipment and personnel across, provisioning, smokescreen, even water supply. Engineering troops can perform a large scope of tasks. And since the morning of February 24th, when Russia's full-scale invasion began at 5 a.m., we mined the roads, mined the terrain, mined the bypass roads, mined the approaches to ensure that the enemy advances in directions that benefit us. On the morning of the 24th, at 4 a.m., we headed to the Kharkiv region. In three cars, with TNT and detonation equipment. We had been tasked with blowing up three bridges. In the Kharkiv region, we were the first to blow up a bridge at 7 a.m., right under the nose of the approaching enemy. The bridge was blown up, and their entire reconnaissance party flew straight to the bridge. As the enemy approached the bridge, we destroyed it. We blew it up. The bridge exploded, the entire convoy came closer, pulled together, stopped, and our artillery had time to aim and fire at the enemy. This was our main mission when the war started. You know, mines are also a psychological problem for the enemy. Because when the enemy advances and its IFV or tank is blown up by a landmine, it's not easy to send another crew through the minefield. I spoke to one reconnaissance officer and he said, you know, I thought that the reconnaissance were the toughest guys, but when I saw sappers going before me, I realized that you are tough. <laughs> There is no room for air. You have to be alert at all times. You do have to do everything cautiously and quickly. A minefield has to be set up at night. You know all the technical means that are used in modern warfare when you look through a thermal imager and see mice running in the field. But there we were, about 20 burly men, so everyone can see them. 
We always consider all possibilities and train our personnel so that in case of an attack, we can protect ourselves. Our anti-tank gunners show unsurpassed results with javelins, in-laws, and other anti-tank systems, such as Stugnas. A reconnaissance unit has a mission somewhere behind enemy lines. They have their own sappers, but when they want to bring professionals who deal with this daily, it feels safer. So we go and clear the mines. They can't make one step without us. The enemy entered the town, and we fought the first battle. Of course, the town was completely deserted. Some had left, others were hiding. There was almost no one left in town. On the evening of the first day, on the 24th, odd new people started driving around in strange civilian vehicles around our military base. So we decided to establish a rapid response team. It tracked down those strangers, not locals, Russian speakers. Many separatists were detained. No one was captured without reason. Of course, this is our profession, but we also carried out raids, urban combat and air defense. Engineers with stingers, just think of it. I said, Give us a plane and a submarine and call us rangers. This is how the war started for us. All of a sudden, on the second day, right away, all our hunters, all our boys got organized. Awesome. We did everything. But our main responsibility was food. We emptied our cellars, we brought canned meat, and we fried pancakes. We overfed the boys. <laughs> Later, after they had been taken care of, we started doing what hunters should. We started to help our military track down those assholes, the enemies. From here you can see the village of Hrinchenkova. Hrinchenkova, you can see the road to Chupakivka. The local self-defense was organized on the very first days. When convoys started moving past the village, we were watching, observing and reporting the con convoy's locations. Our hunters were everywhere, along the border, in Krasnopila, and so on. We knew and reported about every meter of their advance. On the second day, the invaders tried to break into the town. They came from Velikopisarivka with heavy equipment. They knew that we were in Otirka. Their armored vehicles came first, they were ready to fight, and we were ready to meet them. We knew that they were coming. We destroyed several armored vehicles and their personnel, and they retreated again towards Velikopisarivka. Why was Otirka able to hold out? Because there's a river on one side. What stopped the enemy's offensive from the north on Otirka was the destruction of a strategic bridge in the village of Klementeve. The bridge was destroyed on February 25th, at about 3 p.m. The enemy's vehicles did not pass. Because the Tirka residents waited for its construction for a very long time, something like eight years. 
But if not for this bridge, we'd have to meet the Russian aggressors in our hometown. Otyrka held out. The 93rd Brigade arrived. They took the burnt, they took the brunt of the attack. When heavy machinery started advancing and the artillery started working, they pushed them back. On the second day, around noon, we were shelled by Uragan multiple rocket launchers. Oregon's shells started falling. They landed in the park in Dachny district, on the 93rd's position. They were hit a bit then. I have a hobby, aerial photography. I have a quadrocopter. I was flying it to see where the convoy was. Then our commander got a message on the walkie-talkie about incoming strikes, somewhere near kindergarten. So I said, let me fly and have a look. I flew over the kindergarten. My mother used to work there. There, right in front of the entrance, I saw civilians who had been hiding there. There was a bunker under the kindergarten where they were hiding. They had gone out for a breath of fresh air. We found out later that there were children there as well. Реактивні системи залпового вогню. Нагадаю, що ще вчора Володимир Путін говорив, що вони цілять тільки по військових об'єктах. Так ось сьогодні вони не просто поцілили в дитячий садочок в Охтирці. Є загиблі, зокрема, і поміж дітей, є важко поранені. На третій день, на 26-х, it was the same. We were building up forces, arming up. It was such a nice day. It seemed that nothing bad could happen. Soldiers were resting in the barracks after completing their missions. It was lunchtime and people were everywhere, in the dining room, in the barracks. They were preparing defenses, receiving weapons and bringing in ammunition. A bit further, behind this wall, were all our conscripts over there. When I went into the office, there were fragments of a burned computer. That was all that was left. It was about 2 p.m. when we went to the checkpoint with another sergeant from combat personnel. We were literally 30 meters away from it. The first guided air bomb struck. It hit the barracks. There were about 200 people there at the time. It's a powerful weapon that does not leave any chance of survival. On that day in the barracks, 45 people were killed. There was an explosion. I had never heard such an explosion. It was terrible. It was so powerful it made my head shake. The only thing I remember, really, is the sound that often comes to my mind. This strange squeaking. And then I realized that I was knocked out and just switched off. I asked right away where it landed. They shouted to me from the checkpoint that it hit the barracks. Everything swam before my eyes. I realized that my wife was there. The 
The guys were already carrying someone out. A lieutenant ran up to me, shouting that Anya was alive. He had taken her out. Anya was alive. I realized that it was a strike. I heard someone moaning. The first thing that came to my mind was, who is still alive? I could not see anything. Everything was white. The air was full of dust. There was a buzz in my head. I was totally, so to say, disoriented. There was a bed here in the corner that was completely covered by rubble. All I could see was a leg, an army boot. I understood there was a man there. I ran up to him immediately. There was no fear in my head. There was no thought that something could explode somewhere. I just stuck him up. I threw those huge blocks away and tried my best to dig him out as quickly as possible. When I came running in there, it was just, there was dust in the air, something was burning, something was falling. Finally, we had managed to free the man. His face was completely covered with blood, he was injured. And then my husband came running in. She was frightened. She couldn't hear well because she had a contusion. I asked, are you okay? She said, I'm alive. I nodded my head to let him know that I could hear him. My husband wanted to take me out. I said, no, take this injured man. So he and the other boys took him out. At this moment, in the barracks, those who were not in the bunker were taking people outside. You could see it on the security cameras. They were looking for survivors, dragging them out. Those are real heroes. They went in without fear to find those who were still alive. They didn't know what would happen next. I saw the guys who were carrying an injured man. I said, guys, let's take the wounded and carry them to the medical unit. We ran to the headquarters where some other guys took them from us. All those wounded were taken to the medical unit. A plane started circling over the medical unit. We ran to the medical unit and heard cries, incoming! There was an incoming strike. Then there was a second strike. It hit the medical unit. It was a hard blow. Even the car rocked. I was standing with my back to these barracks. There was a trench in front of me. I was showing my guys where to run. After the explosion, I was thrown into that trench by the blast wave. We were protected from the shrapnel by a nine-story building in front of us, a bit off to the side. I realized that the guys who took the wounded from us, they, most likely, they were gone. It's just that after the explosion, there was no chance that anyone had survived. Everything was covered with a thick layer of bricks that when they were taken out, frankly, it made my heart bleed. Those boys and girls who died heroically in the medical unit, they took the stretchers, carried the wounded, dragged them there, and we found their bodies there together. I'm not sure if I was hit on the head or the helmet. I only remember the moment a soldier from my battalion came running. He grabbed me by the collar as if I was a child and dragged me out. I was in the center of the barrack square when the ammo started exploding. There were anti-tank mines that exploded. There were Muha RPGs. It was loud. There was ammunition that detonated. Many guys were just vaporized. So to say, they were burned up after the explosion. There were powerful explosions. We moved away and didn't return for two days. There was a fire, an inferno. Explosions continued for two days. As we were leaving the barracks, there was a third strike, literally, after a couple of minutes. When everything was quiet, we came out and saw the damage. The survivors started cleaning up, getting people out. I heard someone shouting to me, this way, this way, I ran straight to where all our people were. I was in self-defense mode. Maybe it was an instinct, I don't know, maybe you can call it a warrior instinct. It's when you come and say, weapons, give me weapons. We were ordered to take all-around defense. News was coming about 
a possible enemy infantry attack. But some people kept taking all the wounded. Everyone came to the rescue. Some civilians came from somewhere. They helped us dig out people from under the rubble. We pulled out 26 men. They had been buried for six to seven hours. Ripped off limbs, torn faces, some people were contused and completely deaf. They didn't even react. I shouted, but they didn't react at all. And some had burns, very bad burns. Only the parts of the body covered by the armor remained intact. Of course, this is very scary and hard to deal with. You just had a smoke with the guys in 20 minutes ago, and now they're gone. It's very hard, very hard. The main forces of the regiment were withdrawn from the city. I was the last one to leave with a battle flag. The city was empty. Shooting on the outskirts of town, some shooting inside, and some odd rounds. Everything was exploding. I went around our unit once again to make sure that we had taken everyone out and that no one was left behind. Then I headed straight to the hospital. This was the end of the third day. The worst day. Now I had another mission, the most difficult one, I believe. Our soldiers who were killed in action, our losses. This is the worst thing that can happen. And the most terrible thing is to lose a loved one. I decided to personally visit each family member of the deceased. Mother, father, wife, you just share their grief. It's hard. It's even, it's scarier than fighting a war.
On the fourth day, the fighting continued, the shelling continued. A little plane appeared, as we call it. It appeared sporadically. In the morning, in the evening, at night, in the afternoon, at very low altitudes, they probably knew that we had no air defenses here to hit it. The first time it flew over the park, we could see the face of the Russian pilot. We tried to shoot it down with an assault rifle, a plane with an assault rifle. This is our fleet of engineer vehicles. We are in the shelter that was destroyed because to say that it was hit is meaningless. It was destroyed by an enemy aircraft. It came a second time and dropped eight more bombs here. Two of them landed here. And one, two, three, four, seven. Immediately glass started falling into the shelter. I ordered everyone to leave and take cover. What came next was so scary that we were almost afraid to breathe. They were attacking us from all sides, shelling, shooting, planes were flying over our heads. We were sitting here and talking when we heard the airplane. We went out to have a look. Bang. A missile hit the factory. Half of the building was gone. They started shelling the infrastructure. Food storage, fuel storage, POL center, train station. They also shelled the city council and a supermarket. There was a shelter for civilians under the supermarket. Maria. They would fly in broad daylight. They flew at a very low altitude. These are supersonic aircraft. You could only hear them after they're gone. They wanted to sow fear in every resident of Otirka by dropping those bombs. They also dropped conventional aircraft bombs, missiles, thermobaric and vacuum bombs on the thermal power plant. Those can destroy an entire building with one blast. После авиаудара продуктовый магазин полностью разрушен. Посмотрите, он находится прямо в центре жилого массива. Второй удар пришелся на теплоэлектростанцию. Russians are not just murderers. Russia is committing genocide against the Ukrainian nation. In the old days, in the 1940s, one could not know the forecast for five to ten days. They knew the temperature would go down to minus 20, and they deliberately destroyed the heating system of our city. The power plant stopped working after March 2nd. The TEDS destroyed, the heat in the city will not be. The Russian world is full of destruction, which says that they are bombing the peaceful population. The decision to evacuate the city was made after they had the power plant out of operation. There was no heat and the temperature went down to minus 10 degrees Celsius. So we had to evacuate most of the population from the area near our base. We were in trouble. We were very vulnerable from the sky. 
We had no stationary anti-aircraft defenses, no manned portable air defense weapons, nothing. I turned to our commander, and he gave us Stinger-type anti-aircraft weapons. We were given the weapons, but there was another problem. The personnel, the people, at first glance, we had no personnel. But if you sit down and think, you can find everything. Some of our mobilized officers had dealt with Eagle Man pads before. No one had any experience with stingers. It was unknown territory. It was interesting. Well, there is such a concept as Ask Google or Ask YouTube. We're going to step up. You're going to insert your VCU or NICAD. You see it. You can track it in sights. So now you're going to lift up. And you're going to activate by pressing down. Back here, you've got your activate clear blue sky. They read the instructions, they touched it, and they clicked around. And they reported to the commander that they were ready. If the Mujahideen in Afghanistan were able to operate stingers, why couldn't Ukrainian Cossacks do it, right? We organized training. We chose the most trained and motivated servicemen. This is how sappers became air defense specialists. I served in Otirka before. After the unit was formed, and after several unsuccessful, well, let's say, there have been some mistakes. An air alert system in the plane is activated when a missile is launched at you. The pilot of the plane is just a human, so he's also afraid, and he doesn't accomplish his mission. He retreats to a safe distance with all his ammunition. That is, we drove them all away from the city. And I think they drew conclusions and reported that there was a manpads unit in Otirka. So they started flying. At night or in the clouds, or they flew very high, where air defenses couldn't reach them, at least the ones that we had. They were afraid to fly low, so they lost accuracy when bombing. The Vorskola River where my people are stationed, there's no one in front of them, no border guards, no other military. Their positions are hidden. The border is that way. Behind that hill and over there. This will be the last checkpoint. There is no military after it. I was wearing a yellow sun hat, track bottoms, and a t-shirt when we were setting up the minefields. They stretched as far as the border, the fence, and the anti-tank ditch. It was very dangerous to do wearing a military uniform. I just had a gun in my pocket. No rifle, nothing, no body armor because it will give you away. You have to look like a farmer. Those trees are on their territory. Now we will see their tower. Here it is. That's it. Everything further is their territory. Yeah. 
Their border guards are keeping watch. On this side, the border is that way. We open the cover, we pull out the sight, and we look. When we see a plane in our sight, we shoot. And that's it. We have a result. We shoot down helicopters and planes with this. We are now literally one kilometer from the border. This is, uh, this is kilometer zero of the Ukraine-Russia border. Our task is to prevent enemy aircraft from entering Ukrainian territory. We are keeping watch. If the aircraft appears, it will not pass, that's for sure. As for the weapons, I've got what I wanted. I now have a 762 anti-aircraft gun made in 1972. That is the right tool to destroy the orcs. I served in the airborne forces. I was trained under the Soviet Union. I just want to show you what kind of paratroopers they have right now. They are not paratroopers. They are just... Their only advantage is the huge quantity of all kinds of weapons. That's it. Our advantage is quality and performance standards. When the war started, it united us. Everyone was working towards victory. Our boys, hunters, local authorities and residents. Everyone brought food, everyone helped, everyone worked as one. We had everything. Food, fuel, intelligence, support, and hunters. The hunters, in fact, were awesome. My hunters called me from Hrun. They said, we have nothing with us. We are following six of those. There are six Ruskis here. They are armed to the teeth. So the boys followed them, armed only with smooth bore guns. It was clear that something had to be done quickly. I called the commander. We went to the park with Tolik and obtained machine guns. This was near the village Hrun. The village Hrun in our Ortyrka district. There were hunters from Ortyrka, Hrun, and Zenkiv, who drove up from the other side. It wasn't far for them. Together they encircled the Russians and drove them into the forest. There's a forest near the village, a ravine. There's a pine forest and they drove them into the ravine and the boys gave them a fight. We wounded their commander and they surrendered. The Ruskis surrendered. The boys captured them. The guys from the UAF said that they had captured some serious guys. When the fighting was here, their tanks were meandering around, like they were shit floating down the Yenisei. They didn't know where to hide. So the boys invited us. They said, come for a safari to Hadich. After the liberation of Trostinets, we went there to clear the mines. We set up a pontoon crossing across the Horskal River at night for our troops to attack the enemy. Five minutes from this side, five minutes from that side. But now we have a traffic jam. So this side is not moving. This is our unit's mission, to set up different types of crossings for different types of combat. This is one of them. This is a bridge crossing. 
all civilian vehicles, all military vehicles, and all military equipment can cross safely. I believe we are where we need to be and ready to do everything to bring victory that much closer to expel all the orcs from our land. Why did they think someone was waiting for them there? It's incredible what those dogs have done. It's not just Irpen and Bucha. They did the same in Troskenets. Understand? Everywhere they went, they did the same. They are vermin. I don't even know what to call them. It is difficult to describe the condition of the people in Trostenets when it was liberated. It's a nearby town. They were frightened to the point of being speechless. When they saw the Ukrainian military, they could not speak, they just cried. The regiment unit's current mission is to demine the newly liberated territories, including Trostenets and the areas of our Artyrka district where the enemy was stationed. In the city of Trostenets, the Russian troops set traps everywhere, in washing machines, in the woods. These are mostly grenades with tripwires or anti-personnel mines with tripwires. We collect them into a pile in areas with lots of scattered ammunition. We collect them and detonate them. Today is our day 56 or 57 with no days off. We haven't had a day off yet. We work every day from morning to night. It's not an easy job, but when you get used to it, it's done automatically. You have an adrenaline rush and you have no fear. And you even, you do everything on autopilot in a good way. You stay calm, even your hands don't shake. It's hard. It's hard, but it can get even worse. And in order to prevent the orcs from doing it, we have to be in charge. The Russian Federation has withdrawn from part of the Geneva Convention. It is not party to it, and it reserves the right to use all munitions it has at its disposal. And that's exactly what they are doing. Their latest development is the new mine lane system called ISDM Zimledelia, which lays mines remotely. They plant anti-tank mines and they cover those anti-tank mines with pressure activated anti-personnel mines. They are really mean. We continue to build up the defenses of the city to conduct combat training because people are mobilized. They come and they have to be trained. Here for your attention are the new models of weapons that we have received through land lease from our friends, the United States. This is an armor-piercing mine. It can be planted in the ground or in harder, denser materials such as walls using a special anchor. Yes, we receive critical assistance from our allies, new mines, new models. Those are mainly anti-tank mines, new ones, made in 2017. Some of them have just entered military service. They will help us significantly in deterring the enemy. Today, my group received a combat mission order and went to work with the new equipment we received.
Some of our units are now here in Otirka, while others are stationed in other places where they carry out the same missions that we performed in the first days, planting and clearing mines, spanning rivers, and so on. We have a large unit, and since it's quiet here now, and the authorities have taken everything into their hands, we help restore buildings, restore heat and water supplies, people are returning, the city is coming back to life. It's very good, it's just, you drive around and think how cool it was before the war, and you hope it will be the same way and that the enemy will never return to our land. There are no Russian speakers here who support Putin now. Well, you could find bastards everywhere. Maybe someone wants to profit somehow, or maybe those who have some other hopes. Uh, there are plenty of assholes everywhere, but I believe that those die are diehard Russians. And all our people are simply the best, all of them. Thanks to Stefan Bandera, this nation still exists. During all those years, our grandfathers and great-grandfathers, who fought against the Soviet regime, were able to preserve that core and that understanding of who Ukrainians are and what the Ukrainian nation is. The understanding that we have to live on our own land according to our own laws and not have someone from somewhere else, some cocksucker like Putin, tell us what to do. Before, they used to divide us into the Banderas and the East. This divide is now gone, understand? That's it. It doesn't exist anymore, this division. After what this imbecile has done, it's finished. We're all one family now, it's gone. Now the Russians are freaks. If they will make another attempt to occupy Otirka, I don't think the enemy will stand a chance. Because an average Uncle Vasya, a tractor driver, will take a javelin and burn a couple of tanks. All wars end. There are no unending wars. I believe in our victory, in the victory of our strong, courageous people, our nation, and its prosperity. We must do everything to make sure that our children will never know war.